Here on Flow FM, great to speak with the Aboriginal Affairs Minister in South Australia, Kayam Ma. How are you? Uh, very well, and uh, good day to all your listeners. Yes, it's great to have you with us. And you did have a meeting recently of Indigenous Affairs Ministers on closing the gap. We'll get to that a bit later. But you are heading out into regional South Australia about the Indigenous voice to the South Australian Parliament. Tell us, uh, what's the reason for this initiative? Yeah, so you're right. Um, we're, we're heading out to regional, remote South Australia and, and right around Adelaide. We, uh, about a month ago, appointed a commissioner for First Nations Voice, uh, Dale Aegis, who's a, um, a well-known to many Aboriginal people. Um, yeah, has connections to many nations around South Australia, including Ghana, Nurunjeri, uh, Narunga. Um, and he's uh, leading a team that's, uh, over the next you know, uh, couple of months, uh, having dozens of meetings and consultations and forums right around South Australia, from Mount Gambier right up to the APY lands, about a uh, Aboriginal voice to state parliament. Uh, it's something uh, yeah, many people may have heard about uh, in a federal sense, um, yeah, the push for uh, to change to our constitution via referendum to have a, a, a an Aboriginal voice to federal parliament, but it's a commitment that we made before the election that uh, if we were lucky enough to be elected in March, which we were, we would have a state-based version of this, um, and we committed to the other tenants of the state from Uluru, so... Uh, that's something we're, we're now consulting on how it will look and how it will operate and a representative Aboriginal voice to the South Australian Parliament. Well, I think that Uluru statement, and I th- there was something also about the Indigenous voice uh, concept around the nation, they're looking at implementing that not just at federal level, but all state levels, indeed even at the local government level, but uh, it won't require a constitutional change in South Australia, I gather. You can simply, well, it would, but you, the Parliament can make those changes? Yeah, that's right. So I, I, I suspect the way it's going to end up in South Australia is... Um, our own um, piece of legislation to create uh, the voice, uh, whereas federally um, uh, what is being looked at is uh, a change to the constitution, which would re- which requires a referendum, whereas uh, nearly everything in our constitution can be changed by um, yeah, an act of parliament. So yeah, the, the consultations we're doing now are not about um, yeah, a, a, a vote right across uh, South Australia like they would be doing federally, but... Uh, yeah, consultations about how this body you know, might um, be comprised, how it uh, is uh, represented, and importantly, uh, how it uh, relates to uh, the South Australian Government and the South Australian Parliament. Well, when it comes to a voice, I guess someone can easily ignore a voice. Will it have any power, or will it simply be one that uh, parliamentarians are required to listen to when just considering issues that will affect Indigenous people? Yeah, certainly what, what is being looked at federally, and it's what we're looking at here, is not something that... Uh, yeah, has, I think being um, uh, misrepresented as a third chamber of parliament that is, you know, can um, you know, change decisions, but something that provides you know, the advice and the opinion of um, Aboriginal South Australians, uh, Aboriginal people, and Aboriginal communities. So it won't have the power to block or change um, you know, decisions or legislation, but it certainly will for, um, make sure that uh, those who make decisions are aware of the views of Aboriginal people. And I think that will carry great weight with it, having set up a body. I, you know, uh, governments and politicians uh, will need to um, you know, to listen to and to take into uh, account the views of Aboriginal people. Will it functionally, though, be a situation where there, uh, I guess, a decision of a parliament or even, say, a council, if this is implemented at council level, could be overruled or ruled invalid in the courts if it didn't adequately consider the voice that was being expressed? No, I, I don't think there's... Any any suggestion of that, and you know, certainly you know, federal governments and, and states and territories that have these mechanisms will take that advice. Um, uh, but they're, they're, I, I don't think there's any possibility that can happen. Um, you know, uh, the ACT's had a uh, an elected Aboriginal body for you know, well over a decade. Uh, Victoria's got the first People's Assembly that's a, a, an elected body that yeah, provide that advice or voice to government. And there's been you know, no suggestion whatsoever that um, you know, decisions could be invalid uh, because they didn't take into account uh, you know, uh, views or opinions. And when it comes to how it's composed, there's a great many language groups, nations, uh, that are, you would need a voice to consider. How do you make sure all of those uh, respective perspectives are being included in the voice that's being expressed? Yeah, you're right. There, there are dozens of uh, language groups or Aboriginal nations just in South Australia, um, you know, between 40 and 50 uh, different groups. So, yeah, and that's that's one of the things that the conversation over the next couple of months is uh, is asking. You know, what what's the mechanism for that representation? Um, yeah, is it um, 
uh, is that you know, there have been different models proposed where there's a you know, level of government appointment. Um, our models proposed a direct election model. We, we certainly have it, we, it, it's not something that hasn't been done before. You know, in you know, the 90s and very early 2000s, there was uh, the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Commission, ATSIC, which was directly elected, uh, uh, Aboriginal people directly elected from you know, Aboriginal communities and, and groups uh, across South Australia in, in you know, different uh, divisions across SA. So it, yeah, we'll be looking at what's happened in the past, but also you know, how that body might be... Um, uh, represented and certainly the, the early view and the view certainly that was put to me when we we're in opposition was a yeah, it, it ought to be Aboriginal people deciding who their voice is by some sort of direct say. Yeah, sounds like a good approach. Uh, is it functionally going to be very different to ATSIC though? I thought ATSIC had some control over funding decisions. Uh, this one is very much about a voice and about making sure parliaments are aware of what the Indigenous perspective is. Yeah, that's right, Ricky. Uh, ATSIC was, was set up... Uh, as a, you know, to do service delivery, to make decisions uh, on funding in some areas. Uh, that's not what's being proposed at the state or federal level. This will be a, yeah, a, bo- a, a voice that is uh, you know, um, providing views and, and advice to government and parliament about issues that affect Aboriginal people. Now, this is the, uh, one of the important hot topics, but uh, and somewhat symbolic, some might say, but nonetheless, uh, when it comes to the closing of the gap on health and other outcomes for Indigenous people, you have had an update meeting with Indigenous Affairs Ministers re- recently. How did that go, and uh, how are we going on closing the gap? Yeah, we, we did, Ricky, and it was a, it was we hosted it in Adelaide um, on Friday of last week, and it was a meeting of the Joint Council on closing the gap, and... That comprises uh, all the um, ministers for Aboriginal affairs from around Australia, you know, Linda Burney, the federal minister, and all my counterparts from the states and territories. But also importantly, the Joint Council comprises um, uh, peak organisations for um, Aboriginal services. So Pat Turner co-chairs it with Linda Burney, and Pat Turner is the head of the Coalition of the Peaks, which is sort of the, the, the national representative body for things like... Um, Uh, Aboriginal health services, Aboriginal legal services, uh, Aboriginal um, organisations, look at um, uh, youth and child protection and a whole lot of areas. So uh, sort of some some similarities, and I I think it works very complementary to uh, a voice, that is now Aboriginal people and organisations being at the table where decisions are made. And it it was an important meeting that went through a number of ways that we can do that better, including... um, yeah, um, yeah, identifying funds that are spent on services and looking to divest control for um, yeah, many of these services to Aboriginal community controlled organisations. So, is there a report card or a health check on the on the closing of the gap? Do we do we have an update on how we're moving in that on that initiative? Yeah, the, 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 there are annual reports. I just can't remember what what month they come out in. Um, it, this, this wasn't uh, and then the annual report of this meeting, but. Um, uh, we we have had since 2008 uh, yeah, under the old closing the gap um, and and now the sort of refresh that's been going a couple of years reports that show in many areas we're making progress but not fast enough you know, the the gap between uh, in many outcomes between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people is still too great and although you know, it is closing in, in many many areas it's not fast enough just. As an example, Ricky, if you're an Aboriginal an Aboriginal man born on the APY lands in the far northwest of our state, you have a, a li- average life expectancy of 48 years. Which, you know, in a state that's as prosperous as South Australia, you know, yeah, really is a disgrace. In it's history. terrible. Yeah, terrible. Well, Minister, we are out of time. I know you've got another commitment, so thank you for being generous with your time, and uh, hopefully catch you again soon. Yeah, thanks, Ricky. Talk to you soon.